In this video, we'll talk about the different childhood exanthems, which is a fancy way of saying rashes that spread throughout the body. On your exam, this will be a pediatrics type question, and this is very challenging for most students because unfortunately a lot of these rashes look very, very similar. So as you'll see as we move throughout this video, in order to get these questions correctly, you need to know the buzzwords and the associations, but also the pattern or the timeline through which these rashes spread. So we'll go over all of this. I have lots of easy mnemonics to remember this. And by the end of this video, you'll be an expert on childhood exanthems. Just as an overview, here are the different diseases that we're going to cover. Fifth's disease, hand foot mouth disease, roseola, rubiola, rubella, scarlet fever, and chicken pox. So let's just dive right in. This is, sounds really scary, I, I hear you. I know that you're a little overwhelmed right now, but by the end of this video, I promise you'll feel ready to answer questions about these different types of diseases. Let's start with fifth disease, also known as erythema infectiosum. The pathogen that causes fifth disease is parvovirus B19. The very high yield appearance that you're going to see on your exam is what's known as a slapped cheek appearance. So you see this image on the bottom of my slide. It quite literally looks like somebody was slapped in the face. There's redness on the cheeks and it's a very specific rash. It's a very specific redness. It's maculopapular, it's confluent, it's photosensitive, and it's lace-like. It's going to be on the bilateral cheeks. This may or may not be associated with arthritis. So you want to know arthritis and you want to know that slapped cheek appearance. The way that this works is that the patient will initially have nonspecific cold symptoms. So maybe cough, congestion, sore throat. Then they'll develop the slapped cheek rash and then that rash will spread from the cheeks down to the extremities and the trunk. So that's the pattern through which it moves. The takeaway from this slide is that for fifth disease, you need to know the slap cheek appearance and you need to know the association with arthritis. If you get an image like this on your exam, you have to be able to say, oh, it's fifth disease or, oh, it's caused by parvovirus B19 or, oh, the complication this patient may experience is arthritis. And so because of that, I need to give you a really useful mnemonic. So fifth disease, fifth for the number five. There are five fingers on a hand and you use a hand to slap somebody. So when you slap somebody across the face, you're hitting them on their cheeks, which helps me remember that fifth disease causes slapped cheek appearance. Again, there are five fingers, five for fifth on a hand. And if that hand slaps somebody across the face, they're going to get red rashes on their cheeks for slapped cheek disease. But don't slap them too hard because if you do, you might get arthritis in your hand. And that helps me remember that fifth disease is associated with arthritis. So there's my mnemonic. We're done. Now you're ready to answer questions. Let's move on to hand, foot, mouth disease. So luckily for this one, as the name implies, this causes lesions on the hand, on the foot, and on the mouth. What you need to know is that this is caused by Coxsackie virus A. The lesions here are maculovesicular, and again, as the name implies, it's on the palms, the soles, and the oral mucosa. So hand, foot, and mouth appears on the hand, on the foot, and on the mouth. So they got a little lazy when naming this one. It rarely spreads. It can spread, but it's usually going to be limited to the hand, foot, and mouth, which is going to make things a bit easier for you on exams, because if you see pictures or you read the vignette and you know that it's on the hand, foot, and mouth, you already know, oh, it's, you know, it's HFM, it's hand, foot, mouth. This might be associated with stomatitis, which is a fancy way of saying inflammatory changes in the lips. So while the lesions are on the oral mucosa, if the lips become inflamed, it's because you've got that local inflammation due to those lesions around the mouth. Now, the way that this will work is normally the patient will have a fever, and then approximately 48 hours later, they'll develop the characteristic maculovesicular rash on their palms, soles, and oral mucosa. So, no mnemonic here, because again, the name of the disease is hand, foot, and mouth. So, it tells you exactly where the lesions are. The only thing you need to memorize here is that Coxsackie virus A is the cause of hand, foot, and mouth. And I don't have a mnemonic, I do apologize, but that's the only thing you need to take away from this. So that is hand, foot, and mouth. Again, if you're taking your exam and the patient has lesions on their hand, on their foot, and or on their mouth, you can just guess it's hand, foot, and mouth. Coxsackie A, that's all you need to know. Let's move on to roseola, also known as exanthem subitum. 
So roseola is caused by human herpes virus 6. This is a maculopapular lesion that starts on the trunk and then it spreads to the face and extremities. This is also known as sixth disease. You don't really need to know that name. I just put it here for completeness sake. Some of your uh, lecturers may refer to it as sixth disease. Some older physicians may refer to it as sixth disease, but it's roseola. It's exanthem suidum. Now, this may be associated with nagayama spots. Nagayama spots are uvular and palatal rashes, as you see in that first image. What's incredibly high yield and important to know for roseola is the pattern and the course of this disease. So the way that this works is that the patient will have a high fever, just a fever usually, that will last for about three to five days. And then after the three to five days, that fever falls off and breaks, and then the, characteris the characteristic maculopapular rash will appear as that fever disappears. So this is incredibly specific to roseola. Three to five days of very high, scary fever, then the fever falls off, and once that fever falls off, the characteristic maculopapular rash appears, usually on the trunk and then spreads to the face and extremities. So you need to know the timeline. Three to five days of fever, then rash. And the way that I memorize this is roseola, I think of a rose. And if you've ever given gifted a rose or received a rose, you probably know that after three to five days, the rose petals kind of die and fall off. So it's a perfect mnemonic because roseola, rose for roseola, rose petals fall off after three to five days. And that coincides beautifully with the fact that in roseola, the patient will have a very high fever for three to five days, and then the fever will fall off or break or die, and then the rash will appear. So I want you to think about giving somebody a rose. It doesn't matter if you put it in a, in a vase with water and put it in sunlight. After three to five days, those petals, they're dying, just like the fever. So three to five days of high fever, that fever falls off and then the rash appears. That's what you need to know for roseola. That timeline, that course is so specific to this one disease and that's what's going to differentiate it from the other ones on your exam. So of all the, of this whole list, roseola is the one where I want you to know that timeline. Three to five days of fever and then rash. Now we'll talk about rubiola, also known as measles. Most people just call this measles. The pathogen here is the measles virus. The findings are that we have a maculopapular lesion that usually starts on the face and then it spreads downward. So this, so measles or rubiola works top down, starts on the face, works downward. It's associated with the three C's, cough, conjunctivitis, and coryza. It may be associated with something very high yield called coplic spots. Coplic spots are just these spots, as you can see in this image, that appear on the buccal mucosa. So if you see coplic spots, that is a glaring giveaway that the question is asking you about measles. And this is complicated by pneumonia. So some patients who have measles can develop pneumonia. So it starts with a viral, obviously measles is a virus, it starts with a viral rash, a viral fever, cough, conjunctivitis, coryza, but that progresses into sometimes a bacterial complication of bacterial pneumonia. Very, very high yield for exams is that you give doses of vitamin A to mitigate this. It makes it better. Patients respond well when they receive vitamin A. So the two high yield things for measles or rubiola is one, coplic spots on the inside of the mouth, on the buccal mucosa, and two, vitamin A for treatment. And so the way that this will usually present on your exam is that they're going to show you, they're going to describe someone who's sick, it's going to be nonspecific, it's vague, right? They're going to have cough, maybe a low-grade fever, maybe their eyes are watery. You know, you're not going to be able to know, oh, it's measles. But what they'll do is they'll either describe the coplic spots or they'll show you the coplic spots. And then they'll ask you, what's the causative pathogen? Answer being measles. Or they'll ask you, which of the following should the patient receive immediately? And the answer will be something like vitamin A. Now, the interesting thing is that this video is all about exanthem. X anthem, X meaning on the exterior of the body, right? Rashes on the skin. But coplic spots are actually an example of the opposite of that. They're an example of an N anthem, N meaning inside the body, on the interior. So I, I say that to point out that, yes, these are X anthems, but they're also associated with N anthems, and coplic spots is a really good example of that. 
Now for measles, measles to me sounds like mussels. So I think measles marinara as opposed to mussels marinara, which is a delicious dish that everybody should try. But for measles marinara, what does that remind me? This is my mnemonic here. That reminds me of Coplex spots because if you were to eat measles marinara or mussels marinara, you might get little spots of red inside your mouth because the marinara sauce is there. Um, it also reminds me that the rash starts around the mouth, right? It starts on the face and it works its way down. So measles marinara, because measles sounds like mussels. That's my mnemonic for measles. All right, so we, we are four, four done, only three to go, and you're ready to answer questions because you know the high yield associations already. See how easy this is? Let's talk about rubella. Rubella is also known as German measles. I wouldn't really worry about the name, just call it rubella. The pathogen here is the rubella virus. So this is caused by rubella virus. Now the findings are a maculopapular lesion that starts behind the ears and spreads downward. So rubella is similar to measles in the sense that it starts somewhere on the head and works its way down. But where I would differentiate rubella from measles is that rubella tends to start behind the ears. So that behind the ear feature, very, very specific to rubella. So if you see ear, behind the ear, post auricular, that is screaming at you that the answer is rubella. So keep that in mind. Now taking that one step further, what you're going to see is lymphadenopathy that's post auricular and sub occipital. Post auricular behind the ear, sub occipital, generally a little bit down toward the bottom. So if you see the buzzword post auricular behind the ear, or suboccipital, whether they're talking about the lesion or they're talking about the lymphadenopathy, that is a dead giveaway for rubella. Now this is usually um, going to be maculopapular, but the rash that appears on the trunk as we start to see it spreading tends to be a little bit more desquamating. Not very, very high yield, but if you see the word desquamation as it applies to one of these exanthems, you probably want to guess rubella. Lastly, this is associated with something called a Forchheimer spot, which is a way of saying soft palate petechiae. Again, you see an image here, soft palate petechiae, also known as a Forchheimer spot that's associated with rubella. So the key takeaway for rubella is again, behind the ear, because that's where the rash is going to start. That's where the lymphadenopathy is going to be most prominent. So we need to memorize behind the ear for rubella. So rubella has Ella in the name, which reminds me of when you answer your phone, maybe like someone from Australia, you go, hello, 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 who is this? So Ella for rubella or hello if, for rubella. That's how I memorize this. So that phone is touching the ear. It's touching right behind the ear, which always reminds me that rubella, hello, who is this? That starts behind the ear. The lymphadenopathy tends to be most prominent post auricularly. All right, that's my dumb mnemonic for rubella. So we've only got two more to go and I've got good news, they get easier. So let's talk about scarlet fever. So scarlet fever is caused by strep pyogenes. And maybe you've covered this if you've already studied the bacteria section the findings here are that you have a maculopapular sandpaper-like rash that starts on the neck and then spreads outward. Truth be told, I probably should have bolded and put in red the term sandpaper-like because if you see sandpaper-like rash, alarms have to be going off in your brain that that's scarlet fever. So it's a very unique description. Sandpaper equals scarlet. I just want you to memorize that. The rash has what's known as the postia sign, which is linear petechiae in areas of the body where the skin gets creased. So for example, the groin, armpit, the elbows, you see this in that image on the slide on the bottom left. Basically anywhere there's a fold or a crease, those areas will have linear red lines and they're actually petechiae kind of lining up. That's known as postia sign, very, very high yield. I've got a mnemonic on that in just a second. Scarlet fever is also associated with strawberry tongue. Again, you may be familiar with this already if you've studied the bacteria section and you already went through strep pyogenes. And lastly, the rash and the fever that are associated with scarlet fever that come with scarlet fever that are scarlet fever, 
they're very sudden onset. And you can think about this as like scarlet fever is due to a bacterial infection. It's not viral. So bacterial infections tend to come on much more quickly because there's not necessarily a viral prodrome since obviously it's not a virus. So on your exam, that can be helpful to you if in the vignette, they give you the rash and the fever, but tell you that it's a very acute and sudden onset that kind of points you in the direction of scarlet fever. But again, if you see postia sign, if you see linear petechiae, or they describe it as a sandpaper-like rash, then you need to just stop what you're doing and pick scarlet fever. Now, postia sign sounds obviously like pasta, so here are very straight spaghetti noodles. The pasta sign or the postia sign is linear petechiae, and here I am, I'm showing you some linear spaghetti noodles. Just remember that, very, very high yield. So that's scarlet fever, and then let's conclude with the easiest one to know on this whole video, and that's gonna be chicken pox. So chicken pox is caused by the varicella zoster virus. It is a vesicular rash on an erythematous background. Now that is all you need to know for chicken pox. If you see vesicles on a red background or vesicles on an erythematous background, stop what you're doing, do not pass go, and click the answer that says either chicken pox or varicella zoster. I mean, look at the image on this slide. You can see, and this image is showing you how the rash evolves over the course of eight days, you can see that it is a vesicle that eventually crusts over, as vesicles do, and it has that red sort of halo or background around the vesicle. And so vesicles on a red background, vesicles on an erythematous background, if you see that terminology, stop, the answer is chicken pox. So just like in scarlet fever, where scarlet equals sandpaper, chicken pox equals vesicles on an erythematous background. Now, a little bit more information, not incredibly high yield, but just for completeness sake, let's finish it off. Chicken pox is going to start on the trunk, face, and proximal limbs, and then it will spread. And the patients will usually have very severe pruritus. But no mnemonic here, just know what it looks like and know how it's described. That is chicken pox. So that does it, everybody. You now are very, very well equipped to answer questions on all of the different childhood exanthems. I hope this was helpful to you. Best of luck.